Welcome to the Megillah Project. One story, many angles. Come learn with us. I want to address the issue of violence and morality in the Book of Esther. As we open the book, we are introduced to a big banquet, a party, and then another party of Ashti and with the women. And then the book ends with a party, Esther's party for Haman and Achashverosh. And in the middle is a beauty contest and court intrigue. And the king signs an edict to kill the Jews. And then he signs an edict for the Jews to kill the Persians. This is a vulgar book. God's name is not mentioned in this book. How does it dare to be considered holy scripture? How does it enter the, and the, the Bible? In fact, Luther, not our standard, but Luther considered reviled the book of Esther. He hated it. Maybe most of all because the Jews are victorious at the end but it is a problematic text that we have to consider, that we need to reconsider. My teacher, Rabbi Soloveitchik wrote about it and I'd like to share with you what he had to say. In a lecture that he gave to the Workmen's Circle in 1949 in Yiddish, which my son translated, he says the following. Believe me at times when I flip through the Pentateuch and happen upon a passage like that of the wayward city, I notice the ruthlessness because all have to be killed in the city of idolaters. I notice the ruthlessness with which the Torah commands that everything be obliterated, the inhabitants slaughtered and the city burnt so that the settlement remains a heap forever, never to be rebuilt. And that the Torah evidently considers it all an act of rachamim, of mercy, so severe, so brutal. The same position is taken with respect to the Amalekites. You shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. You shall not forget. And when Saul, who was commanded to kill, slaughter all of the Amalekites in his time, when he behaved with Rachmanus, with compassion towards the king, Agag, the king of the Amalekites, Saul lost his kingship. Is the Torah so cruel, so ruthless as to be unwilling to forgive these sinners? The same Torah which gave the world the first principles of honesty, Rahmanut, and justice, which established the maxim that the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers, seems to have suddenly suppressed all of its ideals and taught the Jew that Rahmanut is a crime. Were the Gnostics, the early Christians, correct in arguing that the Old Testament preaches brutality and the New Testament love and compassion? I once read an essay about Purim by Zhitlovsky, who was the founder of the Union of Russian Social Revolutionaries, in which Zhitlovsky attacked the Book of Esther for the base animalistic instincts manifested therein and for the bloodthirstiness demonstrated by Mordechai and Esther in, setting their, in settling their account with the enemies of the Jews and with Haman and his 10 sons. Now, Zhitlovsky made a point and what's striking is that Soloveitchik embraces it as a legitimate question because it's not a question that we usually consider in the yeshiva or in Jewish schools. The brutality of the Book of Esther. 300 Persians dead, 500 Persians dead, 75,000 per Persians dead, and not a single Jew was killed. And then we'll consider Amalek together with the Book of Esther, the descent who had uh, Haman being a descendant of Amalek and the commandment to remember Amalek and the Shabbat before Purim, reading the portion of Amalek, Shabbat Zachor, it's such an important mitzvah that you must hear every word. Consider the fact that on Purim in 1994, Baruch Goldstein, imagining that he was fulfilling the commandment of obliterating and annihilating Amalek, went into the mosque and killed innocent Muslims in worship in fulfillment of our Torah, Mechiat Amalek. So the words have consequences. The Bible can be a bomb in the hands of someone who sees it as license for carrying out with vengeance the aggressive teaching that's introduced. I see these, this text and the texts in the Megillah that seems to command or allow the Jews, decree that the Jews should kill, as texts that reflect what we call terror, 
X of terror. And we have a principle I, that I learned from my teacher, Christer Stendhal, whom I knew, know through, knew through the Hartman Institute. He was the Dean of the Harvard Divinity School. And he once presented what I call the Stendhal principles. And he taught the following, he said, when I taught my classes in the Harvard Divinity School to students whom I knew would have pulpits, clergy, potential clergy, and we reached the passage in the New Testament that I knew was part of the reading cycle, their equivalent of the Torah reading cycle, and that that passage was anti-Jewish. I taught the following. I said, the, number one, you have to acknowledge the hostility in the text and the violence that it inspires. Number one, own it. Number two, contextualize. Teach your congregants that it's about the first century. It was written in the first century. It has no relevance to today's Jews. Number three, if you can reinterpret the text. And number four, if you can't reinterpret the text, then condemn it and repair, repair the terror and create a new reality of understanding. So let's see how we can apply the Stendhal principles to Megillat Esther and keep in our minds the fact that the Jews were told and, and, and went ahead and murdered Persians, it seems, so it seems, as the book tells us, in revenge. So let's embark on a reinterpretation and understand that the book of Esther is a parody the central uh, 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 term used in the Megillah to express this idea is in, ch in chapter nine, the Naha Polchu, and it's turned around. The whole story is an upside down story. Haman wants to kill the Jews. Instead, Haman is killed, and Mordechai only wanted to hang. Haman is hanged. Everything goes in the opposite direction. Haman wanted the Jews to die. Instead, the story is laughing and telling us that the, no Jews died at all. Only 70, but 75,000 Persians died. Tell me something. Do you know of a war where one side doesn't lose a single, single soul, a single being, and the other side is obliterated in, the, in, 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 in those numbers? It's a joke, not a laughing matter but a joke on the teaching itself, there's something central here, which we'll see in a moment. And in particular, what's happening is, the joke is on the laws of the Persians, because the king who had issued the decree to, to Haman, allowing for the murder of the Jews, could have, we think, in a normal kingdom, rescinded the order. Why the need for any violence? Instead, the book suggests and proposes that the king himself of the Persians issued a decree that calls for the Jews to murder his citizens, his Persian citizens. So we understand that this reversal is a way of critiquing and pointing out through parody that there's something essentially wrong in this society, that's a focus of the teaching, of the moral teaching that needs to emerge out of a book that seems to lack any moral base. So that's the reinterpretation, the repair. It begins with the fact, who is Mordechai? Mordechai is a descendant of the Kish family. Who is the Binyanamite Kish family? Who is the king who didn't kill Agag? the Amalekite and allowed him to remain alive. He's Shaul, Ben Kish, the son of Kish. So Mordechai is the repair, is the tikkun for Shaul because Shaul seems to be so compassionate. However, he was so compassionate that he murdered men, women, and children of the Amalekites. Had no compassion for anyone. Kaf and Hashim. Kill them all. He only allowed the king to survive and the cattle, the good and the metavatzon, the good cattle. That means what he allowed to survive was for his own benefit. So there was no Rachmanus at all. And Mordechai 
and Esther come to repair the violation, the transgression of, of Shaul. So let's look at let's look at this. This is a, a, a pictorial from a commentary on the book of, of, of Esther that really struck me when I saw it. It was printed in 1932 in Munich of all places by an artist named Yosef Kaplan with a presentation of the whole book of Esther. And what it emphasizes is something so unusual. In the rules of, uh, of exterminating Amalek and in Shmuel's, Samuel's uh, um, order to Shaul to kill the Amalekites, the order was total extermination. When the king, Ahasuerus, signed the decree permitting the Jews to, de to take up arms against the Persians, the king decrees that they should kill their enemies, taf finashim, men, women, and children, ushlalam lavos, and to lay their hands on the booty. Yet, this is the text comeback and critique and correction three times, three times, every time it mentions the death of the Persians, 300, 500, 75,000, the text adds as if to push back, to restrain, to limit. Here you see the hanging swords and in the booty, but in the booty they did not lay it. That's the first connection. This was a war, a biblical war against Amalek and the one decreed by Ahasuerus to reflect that, a war that we call a cherem war. Ubabizalo shalchuet yadam is an overturning of the biblical precedent of cherem war where, wherein you kill men, women, and children, annihilate, and you benefit from the booty as mercenaries. We cannot tolerate that within Judaism. That's the message of the Megillah, the counter message against, against the general perception. So the Megillah introduces restraints, limits. It's not indiscriminate. Within a framework of a chaotic story, the Megillah tells us about moral principles and some degree of limitation. Moving on to returning, going back, returning to the parody to elucidate and elaborate the nature of the repair. First level of repair, Babi Zalo Yadam, no booty. The larger issue is the issue of law because the word that appears, I think 18 times in the Megillah is dot. Dot in modern Hebrew means religion, but in Persian and in the Bible, it means, in, it means and, and, and it's particular to the context of Esther and the book of Daniel, it means law. What was Persian law? Persian law was hashtiyakadat. There was a rule about drinking. And there was a rule about how to prepare the harem women. Right? And there was a rule that you couldn't approach the king on, uh, if he hadn't if first called on you, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then you could die if he hadn't, been call, if he had, if he hadn't called on you. And who are the Jews? Datehem, show note. They have different data. Their laws and their practices and their customs are totally different from ours because the law of Persia was bureaucratic. The purpose of the law was to serve the state. It was arbitrary. Even the king was hamstrung by the laws because it's about law for the, it becomes law for the sake of law and not law for the sake of principles, for values. And eventually the law eats itself up and eats up its own people because the law perpetuates a system of evil without any restraints, right? In the law, the king the, for a sum of money could issue a decree to annihilate this group or then annihilate another group. That's not a society, that's chaos. As against this, the Bible presents us with an alternative in the book of Esther of purposeful law, of moral law, because as we see this story of the saving of the Jews results in a holiday called Purim. What's the essence of the holiday of Purim? It's amazing. It's not just having a, a, a meal and having fun and wiping out Haman's name and remembering the evil. Much more significant, we'll see in a moment, we'll read the text, is relationships. Mishloch manot ish to repair 
the evil, the great potential of evil, of indiscriminate hatred, by reaching out to one's fellow in the great act of matanot le'evionim, to giving, to giving matanot gifts to those who are, who are in need, converting, transforming Purim into the great day of tzedakah. And why, how do they do it? Mordechai and Esther, by legislating a holiday. This is the first time that humans in the Bible legislate a holiday, not God, human beings, meaning humans are taking responsibility. That's the great moral lesson of Megillat Esther. It's not that we're ruled by a king or by some arbitrary law, and it's all about partying and wealth of the kingdom. It's about our responsibility, and it's about law that's transformative and then can generate a new society. The ultimate repair is that the wanton, the arbitrary law that could lead to wanton violence, is that, that law is contrary, contrasted by a law that requires the act of tzedakah. So there are, in summary, there are three axis points in the Megillah. Point number one is Ubabizalo shel chuet yadam. Right? They didn't take the booty. It turns around the whole, overturns the whole biblical provision and, and, and uh, of, of cherem, of a war of annihilation and mercenary benefit. Number two, that law is, law is necessary for society. It has to be purposeful. If it's not purposeful, it can lead to the downfall of society. Law can, law can actually justify evil. Law that's purposeful can transform in a moral direction. And the great possibility introduced by the Megillah is the third axis point, the Nahapoch. We can turn things around. We can reverse. We can repair. We can look at the evils in society and figure out a way through our tradition, through our moral principles, to address them and to create something anew, as Mordechai and Esther did in introducing us to the wonderful holiday of Purim. I want to finish by sharing again with you the last text by the Rambam. The Rambam writes as follows. It is preferable to spend more on gifts to the poor than on the poor meal or on presents to friends. For no joy is greater or more glorious than the joy of gladdening the hearts of the poor, the orphans, the widows, and the strangers. Indeed, he who causes the hearts of those unfortunates to rejoice emulates the divine presence of whom scripture says, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one.